the issues are not in uh, people to people or in commerce. The issues are in the positions that Qatar takes on matters of religion. Hi, I'm Surya Gangadharan. Welcome to The Gist. I have with me Navdeep Suri. He was ambassador to the UAE. And before that, he was also ambassador in Egypt. Uh, he knows the Gulf and the Arab region well. Ambassador, glad to have you. Lovely to be back on the show. So I understand you were in Newham, sir. I mean, um, how was it? I mean, just for our, uh, you know, general interest. Well, my f first visit with the Fiki delegation, uh, and this was a follow-up on MBS's visit to India last September after G20. I think the scale of ambition uh, is mind-boggling. And uh, if, uh, if the Saudis pull it off, uh, and I think they probably will, uh, then mm -hmm. it would be... Uh, recorded as one of the truly visionary uh, projects. Uh, it right now looks very futuristic, but it's almost uh, an attempt to define the future for us. Amazing. When you have the money, you can do anything. When you have the money, but combined with the uh, ambition, the ability to yeah. get, get the best talent, uh, and, and a certain clarity of purpose, I guess. Uh, one of the things that I heard from some of these top level uh, experts who are handling the renewable energy and the engineering and design and uh, water and desalination and all of that was that you know many of them come from Europe um, or from the US and uh, they're used to dealing with governments in the four year time horizon. Mm. And for them to be working with somebody who's looking at a 30 year time horizon um is the stuff of dreams and backed by the resources of course great you mentioned some key words there ambition you know struck me when i look at uh, the uae and qatar you know uh small goliaths you want to call them that but big on ambition and punching above their weight what is it i mean generally when you look at these two small uh, countries you know what is it that strikes you about them I think uh, one is, you know, D Donald Rumsfeld famously <laughs> described um, UAE as the little Sparta. Absolutely, uh, and, yeah. and, 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 and the reason was that for a small country, it had also developed an outsized military capability. And a lot of people don't realize that, but it's, it's, it's something that our own um, um, defense personnel, when they do the uh, bilateral exercises, uh, is it something that I've heard them testify to that these guys are actually very good uh, mm -hmm. uh, and they've built a solid um, supply chain, so to say. Uh, they're probably the only guys in the region who can do uh, competently aerial refueling and hit targets as far away as Libya. Uh, they're also mm -hmm. the only guys who've seen action since Afghanistan post 9-11 uh, in yeah. different theaters of war. Um, I think what you have is a new generation of leaders uh, who are uh, not content to put up with the status quo. Uh, you have uh, leaders who have uh, the resources uh, and who have a fairly clear understanding of what their country's position in the world is going to be. So, yes, there's no shortage of ambition. Uh, and I think what you are also seeing is... Uh, 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 explicit or implicit, but different levels of competition amongst them. So yes, you have two small countries. UAE is the world's sixth largest producer of oil. Qatar is probably the largest producer of natural gas or the one of the top producers of natural gas. Uh, and they use uh, the, the resources that they have come in, but with very different purposes, I should say. Uh, the, the, the purpose is not common. So let's come to the UAE. You were there last week for the inauguration of the uh, Swaminarayan Mandir. Uh, hugely symbolic, isn't it? It's symbolic because one, of course, you know, the prime minister made the request to the uh, uh, to Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed when he first visited uh, uh, UAE in uh, what was a path-breaking visit in August 2015. Uh, yeah. uh, and, and thereafter, we got the land and we got the permissions and all of that. And today, that temple has become a magnificent uh, reality. But I think it's equally important to say how 
changes that have taken place in UAE over the last 20 years or so have made that temple a possibility. It doesn't come out of the blue. Abu Dhabi Absolutely. in particular, compared to Dubai, uh, was a far more conservative place. Uh, but, but, but I think if, if you one were to look at uh, the evolution of their position, my sense is that first 9-11 was a wake-up call for them. Uh, the idea that from this prosperous, apparently happy place, you could have Emiratis actually joining with the Saudis to bomb the World Trade Center. Yeah. Uh, and, and that in, in initiated a, a number of steps that they started taking to within their own country. And then we saw a further acceleration of that post uh, the abortive uh, Arab Spring. Uh, because the the fact that you had a Muslim Brotherhood come into power in Egypt, its affiliate come into power in Tunisia, uh, uh, almost gave rise to the fear that it could be a dominoes effect. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and, and so the uh, more conservative anarchies of the Gulf saw it almost as an existential uh, threat uh, and, and, and decided... And in the UAE, I've heard this from the leadership on more than one occasion, to say that we decided that this is not how we want our future generations to be. We want, don't want them joining Al-Qaeda. We don't want them joining ISIS. We want to create a different paradigm of the relationship between state and religion. So I'm not saying that they've suddenly become secular states, but what you saw since 9-11 was two or three very distinct things happening in UAE and now subsequently in Saudi Arabia as well, uh, which has, uh, I think, emulated some of them. Uh, they banned Muslim Brotherhood and declared it a terrorist organization. And they said, we have zero tolerance for radicalization, extremism, uh, violent ideologies. And they actually decided to contest that space with Al-Qaeda and ISIS. Um, they set up something called Hidaya, which was a center uh, of excellence, a global center of excellence to promote uh, uh, the contest uh, uh, against the radical ideologies. And they created Sabah, which would do the same thing online and not leave extremist ideologies uncontested. In fact, they would get prominent theologians to argue that what the Al-Qaeda or ISIS are uh, citing from Islam is profoundly un-Islamic. So you could mm -hmm. see that transition happening. The next logical step to that was to create this Ministry of Tolerance, uh, to put it under the uh, uh, charge of a very uh, senior member of the royal family, uh, and to proactively promote interfaith harmony through conferences, through events. Uh, and, and, and I think it, that led in some ways to the Abraham Accords and the rapprochement with Israel. I saw the way they went about cleansing their texts of anti-Semitic material. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and now in, in Abu Dhabi, you've got this house of Abrahamic family. We're yeah, yeah. with the same compound. And of the same size, you have a synagogue, a mosque, and a church. And, 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 mm -hmm. and you know, it's a very prominent visual uh, um, symbol. And I think that Hindu mandir, the Swaminarayan mandir that has come up, uh, in Abu Dhabi, and it, and it truly is magnificent, should be seen in the context of that evolution that the leadership of UAE has undertaken very consciously over the last 10, 15 years uh, uh, to distance the state from matters of religion and, 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 and to say that, you know, your religion is your personal affair. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, Qatar, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, Qatar, you know, so near yet so far apart when it comes to those kind of ideas, where would you place Qatar? What are they trying to do? So Qatar paradoxically decided to use political Islam as an instrumentality for its own ambitions. And I, I think the real contestation again started uh, with the Arab Spring um, in Tunisia in a small way. But then in, in, in particular in Egypt, where we saw both Qatar and Turkey under President Erdogan um, give very strong support to the Muslim Brotherhood government of uh, President Morsi. Um, and, and we saw 
a countervailing attempt by Saudi Arabia and UAE uh, yeah. to, to and uh, in a sense, to undermine or bring down that government. Uh, and, and of course, we know who won in that particular contest. Uh, but I think what was worrying for um, the Saudis and the Emiratis and the Bahrainis in particular was the manner in which Qatar was willing to give a platform to some of the most um, regressive uh, hmm. leaders from uh, Islam. Yusuf Kardavi, for example, uh, the Egyptian yeah. Brotherhood ideologue, was given a platform on Al Jazeera to spout his uh, often uh, venomous message. Uh, uh, and uh, not just that, but offer a platform to people like him and to Hamas and to others uh, to critique the leadership and the uh, systems of countries like Saudi Arabia and, uh, and, and UAE who were often, because of the reforms that they were carrying out, they were often projected as not sufficiently Islamic or, 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 or running counter to some of their, uh, uh, their principles. So um, you have had this contestation. It culminated, I think, in uh, 2019 with this boycott uh, uh, of Qatar by the four key Arab states, yeah. Egypt, Saudi Arabia, UAE, and Bahrain. And it took almost yeah. three years to resolve that, or four years to resolve that by that, that 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 particular boycott. So you can see how Qatar thought that it could support forces of political Islam, use Al Jazeera as a real megaphone uh, to uh, to promote its ambitions, and and not just uh, uh, um, you know many of us watch Al Jazeera English, which is the relatively more moderate and sanitized version, but the Arabic channel of Al Jazeera uh, really did become a platform, uh, uh, and it built a huge following uh, on the Arab street. And, and and so, for many in the Arab world, it you know if you are a, a an autocratic leader or if you're a monarch, monarchy, uh, it became a destabilizing force uh, in in their countries. And 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 uh, so there was this natural antipathy towards Qatar. But there's no question that Qatar used its formidable financial resources, used uh, 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 its monopoly over Al Jazeera, which uh, which criticizes everything under the sun except the government of Qatar. Uh, <laughs> it's very critical of human rights or uh, abuses in India, for example, or on Kashmir or on. Uh, but but mm. but not a peep as far as Qatar is concerned. And, and I think <laughs> that again is a, again is a is a hypocrisy that people are have have become familiar with. But it really did become a bone of contention between UAE and Qatar. And it was ugly when it when the spat lasted. Mm -hmm. What does Qatar hope to gain from this? They've also got the Americans on their soil. They've got the uh, Afghan Taliban also there. They were operating in office there for some time. And I understand well, there's been some exodus of uh, Hamas leaders from Qatar in recent days. What does the Qatar so, hope to gain from this? So as I said, Qatar said... We are an open society and we welcome all these elements to come. So when the Muslim Brotherhood leaders were thrown out after the coup in Egypt in 2013, mm -hmm. uh, many of them came to uh, UAE, uh, to, to sorry, Qatar and uh, to Doha. And, and some went off to Ankara and Istanbul because these were the two countries that were formally supporting them. Um, yeah. Erdogan itself in, in, in Turkey uh, was presenting himself as a modern day Islamist, a modern day uh, almost an Ottoman caliph, uh, if, if, if you would, a sultan. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and so uh, you saw that uh, these two countries became the fulcrums for disaffected or expelled uh, uh, Muslim ideologues. Uh, Hamas uh, uh, was certainly given a base uh, in Qatar for its political leadership, which continues to, to date uh, to yeah. operate out of, uh, out of Doha. Um, you have uh, Khalid Mashal, for example, the former leader of Hamas, very much based in Doha, and you often see him on, 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 on television. As I said, these are instruments uh, to access, exercise power beyond your uh, borders uh, that uh, Qatar has use, used. Uh, and, and it's cleverly, uh, in the case of Egypt, when it is supporting the Muslim Brotherhood, it was cleverly able to say, hey, I'm supporting democracy. 
uh, and I'm supporting uh, uh, free press. Uh, and, 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 and so, uh, uh, you know, you, you may not have a democratic uh, institution in Qatar, but you're certainly happy to say I'm promoting democracy overseas, which is a bit of a contradiction. Mm -hmm. How do you see India's relations with Qatar? We've come through a difficult patch with those Navy guys and if all that. Oh, you see We've it. come through a difficult patch, but I, I, I you know, I, I, and I think, I think, look, um, the uh, manner in which our naval officers were arrested um, and the whole opacity uh, yeah. around that uh, issue was a major concern for us. And for almost uh, the last year and a half, we had made it clear to the Qataris at various <laughs> levels that it can't be business as usual. Uh, so long as our naval officers are being incarcerated in that fashion. Um, uh, and I really think that it took the prime ministers and the NSA's interventions at the highest levels uh, to uh, secure the release of our, uh, our people. So I think, you know, the prime minister going to uh, Doha last week uh, was a very positive, very strong symbolic gesture, as was his meeting with the with the Emir of Qatar on the sidelines of the uh, COP28. Yeah. But having said that, I think you will continue to have irritants in the relationship so long as Qatar continues to pursue the policies that it does. You know, I follow the Arab media fairly closely and they make sure that no matter how isolated an incident in India, uh, mm. If it involves the Muslim community, they will play it out. <laughs> uh, and, and, and for us, that will continue to be a, 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 a nuisance uh, and an irritant. Having said that, there's a strategic partnership uh, in the sense of uh, our requirements of LNG and the investments that they have made mm -hmm. for LNG. We've just signed a $72 billion long-term contract uh, uh, to import LNG from uh, Qatar. Um, we have a significant Indian community. Uh, we, our companies continue to get projects. So I, I think unlike UAE, where it's almost a frictionless relationship, hmm. um, and there's a very strong personal chemistry between Prime Minister Modi and Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, I think in Qatar you will see uh, that uh, they will continue to, uh, irritants will continue to emerge from time to time because of the positions that they take, or sometimes they say we are hands off, but it's Qatar sponsored media that takes those mm -hmm. uh, positions, which are uh, quite injurious from our, our perspective. And, and, and I, I think uh, you, you will continue to see friction. Uh, and, 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 and mind you, it's not just with us. Uh, that Those points of friction are also present in Qatar's relationship with several of its neighbors. Uh, and, and, and so, Unless there's a substantial change of orientation in, in the leadership in Qatar, um, you will see these points emerge and you won't see quite the bonhomie that we see uh, in terms of a relationship with UAE or even in terms of a relationship with uh, Saudi Arabia, where we see much larger convergence of views. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, with the Qataris, the commercial relationship will thrive. Uh, Indians will continue to go there. You won't see any uh, issue in terms of that happening. No, I think uh, there's a maturity on both sides because both sides need it. I mean, uh, Indians are the largest expatriate community in Qatar uh, and, uh, and make a very valuable contribution to the uh, growth and development of Qatar. And the Qataris are fully aware of that. Um, it, it, it's, as I said, the issues are not in uh, people to people or in commerce. The issues are in the positions that Qatar takes on matters of religion. Mm -hmm. So India will continue to, um, needs to be wary of that going forward. Yes, uh, and it's something that we, we discuss with our other friends in the region and it's, in, it's, it's a bit of a nuisance for, uh, for other major players in the region as well. But, you know, the art of diplomacy is hmm. to try and manage the differences and build on the on the, on the convergences, right? Uh, and, and, and I think with the naval officers issue out of the way, 
Uh, we are back to, in a sense, where we were two years back, where uh, you could continue to build on the convergences and continue to try and manage the uh, occasional irritants that arise. Mm -hmm. I mean, going forward, do you see any uh, softening of the kind of positions the um, uh, the uh, uh, Sultan in uh, Qatar has? I mean, um, uh, perhaps another you generation know, of... I don't know. Um, I certainly haven't seen any signs of uh, uh, that, Surya. Um, uh, you know, the 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 um, Hamas leadership, as we discussed, is based in Doha, and and also yeah. they're finding it useful. When the Taliban were hmm. based in Doha, and and still are uh, some of them, uh, it was useful. So uh, yeah. you know, you might want to thumb your nose at uh, some of those individuals, but the fact is that when the time comes that you need to engage in a dialogue, direct or indirect, with elements that are hostile to you, then Qatar establishes its utility and yeah, as absolutely. a place where you can have sensitive uh, negotiations. Uh, and you saw that throughout the phase before Taliban 2.0, uh, yeah. because their leadership had been given a home in, uh, in Doha. And today you are seeing it in the context of Gaza. Uh, you know, kind of all roads lead via Doha. Um, yeah. Uh, because that's where the leadership is based. Yeah. So, in yeah. a sense, I, I guess I come back to the point that hosting these groups uh, becomes a source of influence for uh, Qatar, uh, uh, yeah. a, a transborder influence where a small yeah, country is it. seen as projecting itself beyond the confines of its own border. Mm -hmm. I think that tells us what Qatar is all about. Uh, Navdeep Suri, uh, great talking to you. A lot of perspective there. Uh, thanks very much. And let's see what's next on the India-Qatar relationship. Since, as you said, that is not quite the frictionless uh, character that the India-UAE relationship has. Thanks very much. Always a pleasure. Sir. That's all we have for you on this edition of uh, The Gist. Um, do subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on social media. Thank you very much.